celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It was strange to see in the Muslim world the preparations in November when we traveled. Preparations for Christmas. You can see the department stores begin to put up their Christmas accessories, Santas and reindeers getting ready, but very few even thought about what Christmas really was. I've never seen a manger in these celebrations in Muslim lands or in churches perhaps but in malls and in all the trees and all the lights it's all about something else so it seems like for the last 200 years the world will also forget to celebrate like it did in the first 200 years but we still remember that Christmas is about Christ, as the very word implies. It's the anniversary of his birth, and the birth of Jesus. The anniversary of life. Although on my mind this week has been the opposite, but we'll get there. Before there's a song I'd like us to sing, it's an old Christmas carol written in 1868. And it's called, O Little Town of Bethlehem. So I'd like us to sing it before I share the message today. It says, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets, the everlasting light shines. I like those words because those words sort of describe this time. where the streets are full of darkness. I like that picture drawing. I take the pictures, uh, the words off a second. I think Manny found, I really like that. There's a light shining in the midst of darkness, a light shining on a child. That has to do with the message also. Children. Life in the darkness. Death. Crying, mourning. Dark streets. But the everlasting light shines. And in fact, it seems that when there's darkness, if that picture were full of light, you wouldn't be aware of that shining light. In the noonday, the shining lights are almost invisible. But in the darkness, when the streets are dark, the light shines as a glistening hope for all humanity. And the light shines, and is shining brightly at this time. And as the surroundings get darker, the light will shine even brighter. 
you've ever had a chance to be away from the city in the dark fields like many times when I leave at night from Hebron it is so dark but there's so many stars the lights of Atlanta don't reach there you look up and there's stars you cannot see here in the same way there'll be lights shining that we weren't aware in the darkness of the night that we are in and the darkest part that is yet to come this next year but there's nothing to fear because the everlasting light is shining upon us and shining upon our children The hopes and the fears. What a contrast of words. It seems like the opposite. One is the hopes shining bright and fears which are so dark. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Put up the words and let us sing this old Christmas carol O little town of Bethlehem how still we see the light above the deep and dreamless sea the silent stars go by yet it As I said, the birth of Jesus was not celebrated for many years by the church. At least the first 200 years, there's no mention of it. In fact, uh, many implied that it's not even the correct date because the sheep do not 
give birth to lambs until the spring. And the shepherds are not out in the fields in the winter. The most common thought has been because it was about 300 years after Jesus was born that they began to celebrate in the middle of winter the birth of Jesus Christ. And the reason seemed to be or so one of the two theories about the date say that the Romans celebrated a very special date to them which was the winter equinox which was the birth of the sun invictus or unconquered sun on December 25th it was one of the pagan solar festivals. In fact, it was inscribed in one second century inscription in Rome. It says, To the soul invic or son Invictus Augustus, which means to the undefeated light and the inventor of it that elevated being divine or close to divinity I'm sure you know what that suggests and so they begin to celebrate on this 25th day in the winter equinox and it became popular But it's very strange because the same date has also a very interesting story. It seems to coincide the darkness and the light. Because we found an ancient writing of the year 200 by Tertullian who reported that it was in the 14th day of Nisan, according to the Gospel of John, when Christ was crucified. And the year that he died was equivalent to our March 25th in the Roman solar calendar. And nine months before this date is December the 25th. So they begin to recognize March the 25th as the day commemorating his death and his conception. So they begin to celebrate the Annunciation on March the 25th and exactly nine months later 25th of December his birth and so it seems that the coinciding of these dates of his death and his conception being on that holy Sabbath that later became Easter or the high Sabbath such opposite celebrations the celebration to the God of the Sun the invisible one and at the same day the celebration of the birth of light the true light in the world not the light of the Sun but the light of eternity the same date how strange that the light of darkness be celebrated the same day that the 
light of God would be celebrated. But today, even though my message has to do with this, not the dates, but the coinciding of light and darkness. Ever since I returned from my trip, almost a day does not go by that I'm not thinking about the death of children. And I'm saying, Lord, what is it that you're trying to say? Please explain it to me. We all know it's in the news of the whole world that this Christmas season, as some are preparing for such a joyous celebration, others are burying their children after the massacre in Newton, Connecticut of 20 children, 12 little girls, and 8 little boys, along with 6 adults. And it seems like the joy of Christmas for so many in this country is paled by an also very important action of darkness. Many headlines said evil came to Sandy Hook, the school. You know, be remember as the day that evil came to town. So Christmas is going to be far from a joyous occasion. It seems contaminated by death and sorrow. But it's not about the children killed in Connecticut that I've been thinking about. It's about the children that were killed on Christmas Day 2,000 years ago. The children of Bethlehem. Because Christmas is the date of the birth of our Savior, but it is also the date where the innocents were killed ruthlessly by soldiers. Where mothers saw their child from six years old, six months old to two years old, snatched from their breasts and killed in front of their eyes. Bethlehem was a town of death. If anyone would say, don't you know this date will be remembered as the brightest day of history? They would look at you and say, are you new in town? Don't you know that this day will be remembered as the day when the mothers cried, when the earth opened, when our babies were snatched and killed in front of our eyes, it's the day of death. And he will say, no, it's the day of life. In Matthew chapter 2, It tells us about this wonderful and tragic date. The date of Jesus' birth and the date of funerals of so many children. Christmas is a story, of course, of the birth of the light of life eternal. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, when they heard the king, Herod, they departed from Jerusalem. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood above where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. In verse 11, when they came to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. 
And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, uh, for many years, uh, one of the churches in ancient times, they celebrated because, see, Christmas was always the 12 days of Christmas, just like our carol, Christmas carol between the 25th of December and the 6th of January. In fact, in many countries, like in Spain, the celebration of the 6th, the last day of Christmas, is more important than December 25th. Because the modern Armenian church continues to celebrate Christmas on January 6th. Although for most Christians, it's December 25th. But that period became known as, as the holidays or holy days. Between the 25th, the 12 days of Christmas, till the 6th, which was the date where supposedly the wise men came in this little verse that I just read and brought their gifts to the child. But the very next verse, one, we see the beautiful story of light shining in that manger, of the shepherds that come and tell their story and look in wonder and awe. Then the wise men with their wonderful story of the star they'd seen in the east and coming and worshiping the child and offering their gifts. What a beautiful time that was. But the time slipped by. The worship ceased. The presents were gone. The wise men looked one to another and said, It is late. Let us go rest. And as they had during their journey, for so long a time from where they came from. They set up their tents and their little humble sleeping quarters and slept under the stars, probably nearby the manger. They hadn't been sleeping long. In fact, they were fast asleep. And in the middle of the night, a dream that shook them. We see about this in verse 12. In a dream, they were warned of God not to return to Herod in Jerusalem. So it says that they departed to their own country by another way. So such a dream, such a warning, probably immediately they gathered their stuff and away they went. Not returning to Jerusalem, but going by another circuitous route back to the Orient. And verse 13, Joseph was also asleep. And when they departed, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, saying, Arise! Take this young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and be there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. It all happened so quickly. The wonderful sight of the manger, the wise men, the presence, the worship. And a few hours later, Hastily, the wise men packed and left. And probably the same night or the same hour, Joseph was asleep. And the angel comes to him saying, get up. Get up now. Run away. This might even have been Christmas Day.
So quickly Joseph arose with Mary and the child Jesus. And they fled away in the middle of the night, leaving everything behind. And off they journeyed towards Egypt where they would spend many years until the death of Herod. We read in verse 14, When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed unto Egypt. Can you imagine gathering everything and leaving at night? Not in a car. the middle of the night. And verse 15 says, And they were there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now I want you to remember these words, because it was prophesied by the prophet Hosea, and they have to do with this message. Meanwhile, Herod had the sneaky feeling that something was wrong. First of all, the wise men had sneaked out of Jerusalem. Second, they didn't come back. They said they were going to go see where the child was and then come back and inform him. That was the deal. The morning came. The sun came out. Are the wise men here? No. Find out where they are. And soon, on Christmas Day, probably itself, the news quickly got back, and they said they left. What do you mean they left? Yes, they left hastily in the middle of the night. They left by another road. And so it says in verse 16, Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceedingly mad and wroth. He was very angry. He was disappointed. He was deceived. Because he expected, as soon as the wise men came and said, we found him, he would silently sent an executioner and kill that child that was supposed to be a king. But since he was so disappointed, he said, I will accomplish the same thing. The child will die. But where was he? They knew, and he knew, that the prophet said, Out of thee, Bethlehem of Judea, he knew the place, but he didn't know where. So he made a tragic decision. Of course, he didn't know. The angel had warned Mary and Joseph. He didn't know they were long gone, had many hours ahead, fleeing towards Egypt. And so he called his soldiers. And he said, I want you to go to Bethlehem and all the surrounding areas and kill every single child under two years old that is male. And we read in verse 16, Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in the coasts thereof, from two years old under, according to the time that he had diligently inquired of the wise men. That word coast was commonly applied to the regions there by the sea, which basically means the adjacent settlements around Bethlehem, all that was in the neighborhoods of Bethlehem. 
there was a writer called Macrobius. And he wrote this. He said, when Herod heard that among the male infants about two years old, which Herod, the king of the Jews, ordered to be slain in Syria, one of his sons was also murdered. So unbeknownst to him, his son, the son of Herod, was killed in that Christmas massacre. And there was a saying born, and the saying was, it is better to be Herod's hog, pig, than to be his son. Because being Jews, they did not kill or eat the hogs. That's why I said it was better to be Herod's hog than to be his son. He murdered his own son. We don't know how large a place, a town that Bethlehem was, nor do we know how many children died that day. It never was a very large town. It's on the outskirts of Jerusalem. So it could not have been such a great number. It probably at that time, it is figured it contained between one and 2,000 inhabitants, in which case the children killed were probably 20 to 30 children. Just like the Newton, Connecticut massacre. In verse 17, it says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah, there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they were not. death, massacre on Christmas Day. The birth of light and darkness so dark. Both coinciding the same day. Funerals, crying, mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. The night before, the choir of angels sang joy to the world. Hosanna. On this day, light is born. And on that day, the children died. Why did they die? What was Herod after? Was it his intentions to kill all these children? No. They were just the casualties of war. They were just, how do they call it, circumstantial. He wanted to kill the child that was marked by God. That's who he was after. All the others were just casualties. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. I have a warning. For the parents that are here and the parents that are hearing and will hear this message. And the warning is protect your children. Darkness is seeking out your children. Why? Because the children of this time will be, among them, will be shining lights that God will use in future times. 
And so the children are being marked for destruction, marked for contamination, marked for killing. So protect your children. And especially want to tell you, seek out a refuge for them. The more I travel, the more I see the spreading of darkness throughout this globe. The more I feel that this place, this country, is going to be one of the last havens of the Christian faith. And even though we are under so much attack from so many quarters, even though Christianity is being ridiculed, prayer is under attack, the signs of Christianity, the cross, they want to take it out of public buildings. But still, we live in one of the most protected countries in the world. In one of the words that God gave a few months ago, through one of his vessels. He said, in the United States, evil will not reach those that are mine. Even though their homes will be broken into, but their children that are mine will be kept. When we lived in Argentina, my father, my brother, and myself, we always referred to the United States as Egypt. In fact, more than once, when God spoke to my father about coming to the United States, he used the word, go to Egypt. Because Egypt was at that time a time of a country of plenty like the United States was and is. A place of much knowledge, invention, and prosperity. In fact, many times when I sought God for a word whether to come to the States or not, He answered, saying, go to Egypt. Now I remember my father saying, mentioning many times about Egypt. And as I see different countries and what is happening in them, I see that this country, the United States, is as Egypt. And it will be a place of refuge for the children of the future. A place of refuge to keep the children, where they can be safe. And it will probably be fulfilled. The word there in Hosea where it says, I will call my son out of Egypt. There will probably come a time where God will send forth from this refuge, from the refuge in the United States, children that have been kept from the darkness and evil and send them forth to different places in the world. But that's another thought I want to leave there on the shelf for now. But I do want to say, parents, protect your children. And this Christmas, ask yourself a question. Is my child safe? Is he being kept from harm? Is he being kept from the evil one? Is he hidden from the world of darkness and all 
its instruments, those tentacles like of an octopus that reaches into our very homes. In this age of electronics, which seems such a blessing, seems such a blessing to be able to communicate when you're out or about. I remember living for so many years in a time that if something happened, you were on the road. The nearest phone was a month's walk away. And now, practically no matter where you are, you have the convenience of a phone. But it's not a phone anymore. They're called smartphones now. Smartphones you can carry with you. And iPhones and iPads and i this and i that. And we carry them into our very homes because they're so convenient. And darkness comes in with them. Because on those wonderful electronic devices, it's a window into darkness. It's a window from the very sanctity of our homes. For many years, our homes were a safe haven. In the homes, the only voices that were heard were the voices of the dad, the mom, the family, the aunts, the uncles that came to visit. And then along came the radio. Then along came the television. And now along comes the personal devices where evil comes right into your most intimate places of your home. Video games. On the little screens, on the big screens. Oh, not video games of exercise. I could use more of that. Probably some of you could too. That sounds good, like fun, but that's not what sells. What sells is those games that have to do with darkness, with wickedness. It started with the worlds of the dungeon. Then it went on to stealing cars, killing policemen, mowing down people. And now the graphics, even blood splattering and killing weapons. And the parents are happy to see their children entertained. And they even buy them those things. So that they kill, boom, 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 boom. And then they wonder, why on earth would they kill people in the real world? It must be guns. The problem is guns. Is the problem guns? When we buy them training videos of how to kill people. And we blame guns? No. The darkness has filtered into the homes into the backpacks, into the pockets of our children. Our children are not safe anymore. Parents flee to Egypt. Hear the warning on Christmas. As you celebrate the light, remember the death of the children. As you give out the presents to your children, if any of those presents are darkness, don't give them to the children. Please, please, not darkness, not killing, not violence, not hatred. On Christmas Day, the day of joy, Remember, remember 
the children that died on Christmas Day. Remember the moaning of the parents. Let what happened so few days ago, and they're still bearing their children as we speak. Let this terrible action of darkness stay with you as it has this week because this week I have heard all week Rachel crying for her children. Rachel crying for her children on Christmas Day. Bethlehem is remembered by us as a beautiful place. But it was less than beautiful that day. It was beautiful for a few hours. It was beautiful as the angels sang and the shepherds heard their song. Hosanna in the highest. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Peace. And a few hours, a few hours, a few hours later, what a contrast of light and darkness. What a contrast. On the same Christmas day, light and darkness, life and killing. So as you celebrate Christmas today, I want to ask each one of your parents, are your children safe? Are your children safe? Pray for your children. Take your children away from danger until the danger is past. That's what the angel told Joseph. Protect this child, this lovely child, this child that God will call forth and will use in the future. This child that will bring forth light into the world. This child that has come bearing the answer to the problems of the world. Keep him. Protect him. Take him away from Bethlehem. Take him away from danger. Look around you. They're killing the children. They're killing them in school. They're killing their minds. They're poisoning their hearts. Just the other day, I heard of a two-year-old child. It was a man that uh, was Santa on a mall. And he told his experience about this little two-year-old child. Well, what do you want for Christmas? I want an iPad. A what? I want an iPad. Or a tablet. What? iPad. Or a tablet. A window. To nice places. But also a window to very dark places. It's just a game about birds. But why are they angry? Why are they shooting the other ones? Well, they don't kill them. It's fun. We hate the pigs. We're going to kill those pigs. It's the most popular game I hear. I haven't looked at it and said, what's so popular about this? There's some things you shoot. <laughs> what? Is that what the two-year-old supposed to learn protect your children
Let me so let me share with you a, sh a very short word that God gave through a young man that he was in a trance and began to speak these words. He says, "The schools mark your children more than the parents do. The schools sow more in your children's heart than the parents do." It's time that the parents begin to dedicate more time to their children. Gather your children. Gather them under the cross. Spend time with your children and spend time with me. The darkness will be great. It'll be so great, but it'll also be very attractive. Beware, fathers, beware, mothers, because those that will be attacked will be your very children. Even the little children, the babes, even the young ones, even those that are entering into their youth, because they are marked. And the more they are marked, the more they are sought out. Take care of your children. Do not abandon them. Television has already invaded many homes. Internet has occupied the place of parents. As a child takes refuge, not in their parents, but in strangers even asking counsel of strangers. So like I said all this week, I could hear the sounds of mourning parents, not in Newton, but the morning of Christmas Day massacre 2,000 years ago. that you might hear the voice of the Lord this morning. If you are a father, a mother, protect your children. For quite a few months, you've heard me preach about the refuge, about God himself being a refuge that he is calling us to go. Started over two years ago when I began speaking about the ark as a refuge for Noah and his family. And I want you to make sure not only that you are in that refuge, that you're in Christ, but I want you to make sure to take your children with you. Just like Noah took his family. Be sure your family is with you in that refuge. Don't say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to take refuge and forget your children. God says, I need their children. I need you to take them to Egypt because they will come forth. My children will come forth from Egypt. I want you to take your children. Take them to that refuge with you. Hold their hands and pray with them. Spend time with them. But not just quality time and go to vacation and, and go to Disney World and, and let, let them become having fun with other things. No, no. Take time with your children. Protect them. Take them into the refuge with you. Pray with them. Gather around the family altar. If ever there was a need for a family altar, it is now. If ever there was a need to protect your children, it is now. 
Because the Herod of these days, the wicked one, has sent the commands to destroy the youth and now even the children. Don't abandon them. Don't let the television raise them. Don't, don't let the smartphones keep them busy. I know you're busy. I know you can barely make it and you're tired when you get home and you say, please don't bother me. But please, please protect your children. Your children are under attack. Protect them. If you're in the refuge, look around you. Are my children with me? And if not, take your time. Grab your child by the hand. Pray with him. Take him to the shelter of the cross and the protection of his blood. You might say, well, my children are grown and they're, they're not in my house anymore. That was the case of Job. His children were far, but still it says every day he offered up sacrifice for his children. Every day he prayed and he said, Father, forgive the sins of my son and my daughter. They're no longer with me. They are far and they're in sin, but I offer this sacrifice for them. Would you forgive them because you love me? So even if your children are not with you, offer up for their, from them sacrifice. I don't know. If it'll work for grandchildren or not, I don't know, but you can try. If it worked for children that Job offered sacrifices, Maybe the same is true for grandchildren. Pray for them. Pray for God to protect them from darkness. This is a wonderful time. But it also is a dark time. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shine the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee. Tonight. Father, in this Christmas season, I pray for our children and the children of our listeners all over the world. I pray that you keep our children from evil. Father, keep my children and my grandchildren from evil, I pray. Show us how to take them out of the sphere of influence of Herod and his armies of evil and destruction. 
Show us the way in the midst of darkness. The way to flee. Show us the road in the midst of darkness that leads to Egypt, the place of safety. Father, I thank you for this country. I thank you for this refuge. This place of refuge for those that believe in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the freedoms that you have given us. And even though they are under attack, I thank you that we still have them. I thank you for the freedom to worship. I thank you for the freedom to pray with our children. I thank you for the freedom to celebrate and praise your name. Thank you, Lord, for this country. God bless America. God bless us. God bless our children. And show us how to protect our children from the evil they receive every day. Inspire the hearts of parents by your Holy Spirit, I pray, that their words may be like healing oil to heal the wounds of darkness. Father, let nothing break the bonds of love between the children and the parents. Let not the evil one drive a wedge in our families. Let not anger separate parents from children. I pray that your love will reign in every home. I pray that your light, the light of your face will shine upon our families. I pray, Father, for the families of this church and the families of those that are watching now and that will watch in the future. Give them this Christmas season the incentive, the decision. May they hear as Joseph the words of heaven saying, Arise now and run. Protect your child, for he is in danger. And may I pray they heed your words of warning. Give them the wisdom to deal with their children, to teach their children, to love their children. Give them the words to strengthen the bonds of love. And may your light shine through them. And may they bring their children into safety. In the arms of love. And that truly, the children that you have marked as being children of light, that they might be safe from the destroying one. Safe though they might go forth one day and bring hope to the world. And they might shine and be greatly used in the power of thy might to shine forth in the world. Thank you, Jesus, for the children. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name that the wombs that are closed of the lighted ones of your children might be opened. I pray for those children that must be born 
I pray that you might open the wombs that are now closed. I ask that the children might be born to thy families. I ask that you might continue to bless this world with children of light. In Jesus' name, let the wombs be opened and let children of light be born. And let this word abide in the hearts and minds of parents that they might keep their children in safety. Give them the strength to go against the tide of this world. Give them the strength to say no when they must say no. Give them strength to keep darkness outside of the doors of their home. Give them the strength not of discipline, but the strength of love. And that love and light might prevail in every home. And in every home this Christmas, of those that are yours, it might be a time of joy and happiness. As we celebrate the birth of the light of the world. In Jesus' name, I pray. Save our children. And save the children of America. Give us, Father, an extension of time that our children might grow in peace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If it were possible, I ask in Jesus' name. 